You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everyone. Lots of people have uh, messaged me and asked me to uh, to do kind of an overview uh, episode on this feed. And I thought it was a good idea. Um, and then Bob Steenstra, a licensed battlefield guide friend of mine, a couple of weeks ago came over to me and he said, hey, you know what we should do on the free feed? We should do an overview while people are waiting for all of your episodes to come out. You can, we can give them a little, a little something so that they know what it's going to cover. And I said, that's a great idea, Bob. So here's what we're doing. We're doing an overview, and it is here right now. Um, I just want to take this moment to thank all of you who have listened to and responded very well to uh, Addressing Gettysburg so far. Uh, I'm sorry it takes so long to do these episodes, but you got to research, you got to write, you got to record, you got to edit. And, you know, those cheesy sound effects aren't easy to find. (laughs) And then I'm recording uh, music. You know, the music that we use is either used with permission or recorded specifically for this. And I am one person. So it takes a while to do, but I hope they're worth it for you when they finally do come out. And without further ado, here is the overview episode with Licensed Battlefield Guide Bob Steenstra. Thank you all. Hello, Bob. Hello, Matt. What are we talking about today? Today we are talking about a just a very simple overview of the Battle of Gettysburg, the Gettysburg Campaign, and uh, you know, but of course, especially the battle, because that's what we're going to be covering in those free episodes on this feed that you're listening to right now. Uh, Antietam to Chancellorsville being one of them. Episode two coming out now, called June, or it's coming out soon, called June 1863 Invasion. And uh, then the subsequent episodes dealing with the, the battle and then the retreat back into Virginia. And, of course, the Gettysburg Address. So, Bob, where do we start with the Battle of Gettysburg? Look at him staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, <laughs> this is an overview. <laughs> yes. So... On a tour, I will talk to people. I'll say, think of this as a six chapter story with a prologue and an epilogue. Okay. And I'm not sure if you want me to do, probably not the prologue, epilogue. Do your thing. thing. Do what you want to do. Give us the overview. But I want to react to questions you're asking. Well, I'm going to do that too, yeah. Okay. But you go ahead, just give us the prologue first. What's the prologue? There's the question. Okay, so the prologue would be the events that take place before January, I'm sorry, July 1st, 1863. Mm-hmm. And that would include um, the context of this battle in the Civil War. And um, then the six chapters, there's three days of battle, July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 1863. And I think it's helpful to think about it as three days of battle times two periods of the day of those three days, usually morning and afternoon, mm-hmm. as soldiers don't usually fight at night but here at Gettysburg on the second night there was an attack and there wasn't a morning attack so for the second day it's best to think of it as afternoon and night mm-hmm. and so you have morning of July 1st the first day chapter one the afternoon chapter two chapter three 23 and a half hours later the afternoon attack of the Confederates on July 2nd followed by the night attack on July 2nd would be which would be chapter four chapter five would be a continuation pretty much of the fight on Culp's Hill on the night of July 2nd it was continued on the morning of July 3rd, chapter five. And then chapter six would be what most people would recognize as Pickett's charge, although mm-hmm. it should be probably called Longstreet's uh, second assault. Okay. Uh, so those would be the six chapters and the epilogue would be the retreat and the aftermath of the battle. Okay. Now that's what you're giving that uh, uh, on a on a two hour car tour. You're not covering East Cavalry Field, but that's also a little part of the no, story too. I, right? I would I I would include that in Chapter Six. Okay. Okay. But yeah, in a typical car tour, we don't have time to get over to the Cavalry Field unless people are specifically asking that. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a, a guy on a tour last week who was related to the Union Division commander in the Cavalry battle, so. Uh, we didn't go over there because we didn't have time, but I did talk about it in a little more detail. I found when I talk to people who are new to the subject of Gettysburg, um, after they get over the shock of finding out that it's not in Virginia and it has nothing to do with George Washington, um, then they want to know what were they doing up in Pennsylvania? Why was the Civil War? I thought the Civil War was all in the South. Why were they up here? Um 
quickly because I know you have a whole podcast about this on Patreon, I think. No, but no, uh, no, oh, no, not that's the free stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, quickly, um, Robert E. Lee in the summer of 1863 is wanting to take the initiative, not just react to Union thrusts at the capital of Richmond, the Confederate capital. He needs to feed an army of, at this point, 70 to 75,000 men. Um, he wants the farmers of Northern Virginia to be able to get their crops out of the fields for once, not have the war traipsing all over Northern Virginia. Uh, these are contributing factors, but the main thing in uh, what I would stress is what's going on in political context in the North, there's a growing peace movement in the North. Mm. And Lee, by moving the war to the North, threatening Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, will draw the Union Army to him in Pennsylvania so that the battle can be fought on Pennsylvania soil while he's feeding his army and while he's taking the initiative. And when he wins, if he wins, of course he doesn't, but the hope is that there will be political fallout in the North encouraging this peace movement. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if the victory is of such a size, he might even be able to leave this battle in Pennsylvania somewhere having negotiated a peace or at least put enough pressure on the union government that they will begin talking peace. Okay. So that's kind of the prologue. Um, yeah. The Southerners moving up here towards Harrisburg. So when, when Lee slips away from uh, the Rappahannock river and we're not going to get into too much detail about the March North and everything, but when he slips away, uh, Joseph Hooker is in command of the union army. What does Hooker do? How does he respond to Lee slipping away? Uh, does he go chasing after him? Does he try to fight another battle? What, what, what goes on there? Well, after some hesitation, not certain what to do, but encouragement from the white house, from Lincoln, mm -hmm. <laughs> your objective is Lee and his army. He will start heading North to uh, make up time because Lee had gotten a head start and uh, he had to be wary of Lee pouncing on Washington from the Northwest. So he's basically gonna head due north from the Rappahannock River area about halfway between Washington and Richmond in Northern Virginia, heading almost due north. Gettysburg is what, 69 or so miles, almost due north, but not exactly mm -hmm. north Northwest of Washington DC. So he's gonna take pretty much a straight shot up. While Lee is taking a little bit longer route to the west using what in the north we call South Mountain, but in the south they would call the Blue Ridge to shield his army to, as he heads towards Harrisburg. It'll be difficult for the north to go over the mountains and, and get to him, the Union. And so it, it, it's, it's heading north and then kind of arcing towards the northeast towards Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. And, and so um, Lee is then able to kind of just basically has Pennsylvania all to himself, right? Well, there are militia units there. There, yeah, there are basically has some northern himself. forces. Yeah. But yeah. as far as the Army of the Potomac, they're not there yet. Right. So he's pretty well free to do what he So needs. he's spread out. He's, he's split up. He gets all, how do they actually get to Gettysburg, though? Well, three days before the battle, Robert E. Lee has spread his army out all north of Gettysburg. Uh -huh. Five days before the battle, actually, a small group of Confederate forces came through Gettysburg, get some food, and keep going. They're heading towards Harrisburg, 40 miles northeast. So, and at that point, Gettysburg isn't this big, important, momentous little town like we think of it today. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay. It's a nice town. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, the Confederates, when they come through Gettysburg, it's just because it's on the road to another objective. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. The, the the bait in the in the trap for Lee was Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're a Confederate army heading towards Harrisburg, there's a lot of roads that come through Gettysburg. And so it's possible that there will be a battle fought there. And even before the campaign begins, Lee will at one point put his finger on a map at Gettysburg and say that a battle might be fought here. Okay. But it's not because it's a major military objective other than roads coming right here. Like, right. Yeah, I mean, if you're, fight, if you're a military person, you can look at Gettysburg on a map and figure mm, we're probably going to end up there because all the roads 
funnel through it. Right. Okay. So three days before the battle, Robert E. Lee's army is all north of Gettysburg, northeast by about 30 miles in the York area, north by about 30 miles in the Carlisle area, and northwest about 26 miles in the Chambersburg area. So his army is uh, dangerously spread getting food as they're heading towards Harrisburg. But Lee thought this was safe because he thought the northern army was further away yet. But on Sunday, June 28th, he will discover that the Union Army is in Frederick, Maryland, 35 miles south of Gettysburg, and has changed commanders. Now George Meade has replaced Joseph Hooker. Lee, knowing Meade's cautiousness, believes he has enough time to get his army back together, and he will order his scattered army to reconcentrate, ordering them not to bring on an engagement until they're all back together. Mm -hmm. So from the Northeast and from the North come the second Corps, at least two thirds of it, of the Confederate Army, what used to be commanded by Stonewall Jackson, down the York Road and basically down the the uh, Carlisle Road, but they, they, they are also gonna come over and actually come in from the Harrisburg Road is Early's division. And from the Northwest, the other two Corps, A.P. Hill's Corps in the lead, that's the newly formed third Corps, and behind them, James Longstreet's first Corps. Okay. So all roads lead to Gettysburg. The Southerners are north of the town. They need to get back together. So from the north, northwest, and northeast, on those roads coming from those directions, comes Lee's Miserables. Mm. They, they called themselves this because Victor Hugo's 1862 novel Les Miserables was the rage. Everyone's reading it, and in English it looks funny. Lee's <laughs> Miserables. Okay. <laughs> So uh, then July 1st occurs, the first day of the battle. Uh, how, do, how does this happen? Um, do, they obviously don't decide, okay, we'll meet you at Gettysburg and have a fight. Well, how right. does it come about? Right. So the Confederates are nearing Gettysburg. They're about a day's march away. Um, in fact, some Confederate soldiers the day before the battle, Tuesday, June 30th, a brigade of Confederates commanded by J. Johnson Pettigrew are ordered to go on a reconnaissance in force to the town and maybe get some shoes because there's are infantrymen and they're always looking for shoes. And they will see that there is a division of Union cavalry that has just arrived from the south. This is the division of John Buford, part of the Army of the Potomac. The eyes of the army are in the lead, as they should be. Of course, Lee's cavalry is not here, so they're blind, mm. um, at least the best part of his cavalry, the intelligence gathering arm commanded by Jeb Stewart. Now, is that is that why he uh, was so spread out beforehand, like he didn't realize because he wasn't hearing from Stewart? Yes, Stewart being the eyes of his army should have reported to Lee the movement of the Northern Army but they had allowed the Union Army to get between Stuart and his cavalry mm. and Lee. And okay. so Lee is in the dark. Stuart isn't in the dark, but he can't get the message to Lee. And this is why Lee was surprised on that Sunday to find out that the Union Army was 35 miles away. So as they're approaching Gettysburg on June 30th, the day before, they're expecting to find nothing but local militiamen, perhaps like they were encountering five days earlier but they will see a Union Cavalry Division. Uh, there's, there's not gonna be shots fired in anger or anything. The two sides are gonna look at each other from a distance, ascertain their relative strengths, and following orders, J. Johnson Pettigrew goes back and reports to his division commander, Harry Heath, that there was a division of Union Cavalry in the town and he couldn't go into the town mm -hmm. to get the shoes. That's on June 30th. That was on June 30th. <clears throat> okay. So the next morning, uh, the Confederates are gonna come back, but it's not Pettigrew's men, it's it's still the same division, Harry Heath's, but it's General Archer's and General Davis's brigades that are marching down the road the next morning. And they, again, are expecting nothing but local militia when, here we are at the battle, Wednesday, July 1st, around 7.30 or so in the morning, the lead elements of the Confederates marching down the Chambersburg Pike will be fired upon by Buford's cavalry. And the fight has begun. For the first two hours, Buford's cavalry, outnumbered, is going to fight a delaying action where they are trading two miles of real estate for two hours of time. Okay. They'll be aided in this by fighting dismounted off their horses like infantry, and there are a series of parallel north-south running ridges west of the town that they can use. So they're fighting on one, 
as the Confederates get close, they will run back to the other side, the protected side of the ridge, the east side, jump on their horses, gallop to the next ridge. And in doing this, they are going to buy about two hours. Mm. About two hours later, 9.30-ish, maybe 9.45, they've fallen back to McPherson's Ridge, where if you've been here before, you know the statue of John Reynolds and John Buford are and the West End Guide Station. It's kind of the beginning of the National Park where you begin to see monuments if you're coming from the northwest into the town. And uh, these Union Cavalry soldiers have bought the two hours of time they were required to do Mm -hmm. and why two hours they knew that the closest union infantry corps the infantry the foot soldiers do the bulk of the fighting that they would be here in about two hours time and so sure enough pretty much on schedule this is john reynolds's first corps of the union army and they will take over the fight for the cavalry the cavalry of buford then will go protect the flanks and begin doing what they normally do intelligence gathering arm Mm mm-hmm And so you have 10,000 Union soldiers beginning to arrive. The Southern soldiers, um, having expected local militia, um, having fought cavalry for two hours, are going to be dismayed when they realize this is Union infantry, this is the Army of the Potomac, and uh, General Archer's Brigade south of the Pike, Alabama, Tennessee boys, will be particularly dismayed because they're going to hit the famous Black Hats, the Mm -hmm. Iron Brigade, one of the two brigades that at the start are making contact with the Confederate infantry. Okay. And so then um, the fighting in the morning of July 1st kind of dies down eventually, and there's a lull. What happens during that lull? Well, I didn't really get to what happened when they first met the infantry. The I, I didn't. Well, then why'd you stop? Well, <laughs> I thought you were paying attention. We're going to ask me. <laughs> I thought you were just leaving it there. No. Okay. Well, then go ahead. Well, go ahead, Bob. Okay. And then you tell me what what happened when the infantry uh, arrived and the Confederates real <laughs> realized who it was. They started to laugh. <laughs> so so oh, when when the Union First Corps infantry arrives. They will push the Confederates back about three quarters of a mile to a a parallel ridge to McPherson's Ridge. That's called Hers Ridge. And by about 11 o'clock in the morning, the Union First Corps division of James Wadsworth has stabilized the situation. They've driven the Confederates back. Being blind, Robert E. Lee not knowing the size of the force he's confronting here yet is not going to be advancing anymore until he gets more information. Mm -hmm. So around 11 ish, 11, a little, a little later maybe, but, um, we now have not infantry attacks so much as artillery beginning to fire at each other cannons at long range for a, a couple of hours. Okay. Um, and then now when the lull occurs, in the uh, late afternoon or late morning or early afternoon. Um, what's going on at that point? Is everybody just sitting there or more troops coming to the field? Uh, is Lee there yet? All these things. What's going on at that point? Well, with this artillery battle going on, Lee is, is still on his way. I mean, he's, he wasn't here when the battle began. But um, when he does get close enough to begin to understand, to get a little bit clearer picture of what's going on, he realizes he's up against a corps of Union infantry, John Reynolds' first corps. And um, he, he, he realizes he doesn't uh, have enough information. If there's one corps here, how close is the rest of the army? Right. And so he's being cautious. And um, meanwhile, the artillery's fighting at each other. There's no infantry attacks during this this period, this lull. There are more Union units arriving, and there's also more Confederate units getting closer. The next major body of men to arrive will be the Union 11th Corps right around noon, shortly thereafter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a corps is about 10,000 men on average. But in the Union. In, for the Union, for the correct. Union, for the yeah. South, it's about double. But the Union 11th Corps arrives, and they take up a position to the right of, or to the, shall I say, to the east of the first core. Kind it wasn't exact straight line, right, but right. basically the first core is kind of on a 
north south orientation so like a vertical line and the 11th core is going to come up to the top of that line and extend themselves almost at a right angle i guess but not really it's relative but they're going to extend themselves to the north of town right. because they're aware from buford's cavalry that there are confederate forces arriving from the northeast on the harrisburg road and from the north from the carlisle road for the ease of the listener, maybe like a boomerang, kind of that shape. Yeah, yeah, that 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 works pretty well. Okay. And, and and the the salient or the the the, the, the angle the angle would be right where the right of the first core and the left of the eleventh core kind of come together, like around the area of the observation tower on uh, that little observation yeah, tower. Yeah, yeah. on, on the, the Mossberg Road on Oak Ridge or Seminary Ridge, as some people call it. Right. There. Okay, so then uh, the eleventh core comes up. Then what happens? Uh, not too long after that, the second corps of the Confederate army, Stonewall Jackson's former command is arriving from the north and from the northeast. Two divisions, his third division won't arrive until much later. But uh, from the north, Robert Rhodes's division, this is the largest division in the Confederate army, almost 8,000 men. And from the northeast on the Harrisburg Road, uh, Jubal Early's division, uh, a little less than 7,000 men. But uh, these are these are some of the best men in uh, the Army of Northern Virginia. Mm-hmm. These are Jackson's former command, and they are going to be hitting the right end of the Union line, occupied by the same men who occupied it two months earlier at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Okay. So we're going to have sort of a replay of what's right. going to happen at Chancellorsville. Okay. By this time, the Confederates have four divisions here because back coming in from the Northwest, AP Hills Corps, Pender's division has arrived as well. So you're going to have 28 or so thousand Confederate forces that are going to be uh, arrayed against about 20,000 Union forces. And not only do the Confederates outnumber, but especially at the Northeast, at the right flank of the Union Army, they outflank that position. Mm -hmm. And so in the early afternoon, three-ish or so, I shouldn't say early, there was no daylight savings time. So think of four maybe in the afternoon by our what we're used to thinking of in terms of sunlight. But uh, Lee has taken the brakes off, realizing his advantage, realizing there is no other Union Corps on the field yet. He orders the attack. Okay. So then the attack is successful? Yes. Yes. And then what happens to the Union line? Uh, it breaks both at the 11th core end and at the first core end. So the, on the right and the left? On the right and the left, correct. Okay. Uh, John Reynolds is dead. The first core commander, Abner Doubleday, has taken over command for that core. But when the 11th Corps arrived, General Howard is now the acting commander on the scene since he is a senior corps commander. The Overall command, you mean? Of yeah. the Union forces there, right. Mm-hmm. Whereas Lee is here by this time, so Lee is in command. But uh, the Confederate forces will attack. It, it um, in terms of percentage of casualties, it's very bad. Like the whole battle at Gettysburg was very bad. In terms of actual numbers, it's the least bloody of the three days of Gettysburg, mm. only because only a, a less than half of both armies are here. Hmm. Okay, 20,000 of 93,000 Northern, about 28,000 of 70 to 75,000 Confederate. Yeah, so the numbers are gonna be less, but proportionally still very bad. Right. But they will capture the, uh, the position that the North was occupying north of the town and west of the town. They will enter the town somewhere around 4.30 in the afternoon. They are in the town of Gettysburg, just entering the town of Gettysburg. There's still going to be fighting going on in the street for a while. But basically what's happening is the Union forces are retreating through the town of Gettysburg to get to a hill just south of it where Union artillery had been placed by General Howard. Cemetery Hill, a very good artillery position. And so the, the Union 1st and 11th Corps have fallen back to Cemetery Hill. And the Confederates have daylight left the battle could continue. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. All right. So the battle, uh, th- there's a big controversial moment where Lee sends an order to Yule, says, take that hill if practicable. Mm-hmm. And uh, Yule doesn't take the hill. What hill is he talking about? And what does that end up doing? How does that set the stage for the next two days as far as uh, Yule's position goes? Okay. So the hill is Cemetery Hill. And um, Yule will not take it because he doesn't find it practicable. Cemetery Hill is an excellent artillery platform of the three hills that will make up what will later be the fish hook shape of the Union line. Cemetery Hill is the best artillery position of the three because it doesn't have many rocks. It doesn't have many trees. It has two roads going over it. It's a relatively flat crown to it. So it's a great artillery position. And uh, he didn't attack that hill. Um, A lot of controversy about that. Many people blame him for that. If I'm in his shoe, I I do the same thing, (laughs) but um, he doesn't attack the hill. He also does not send anyone to Culp's Hill. Uh, For the listener, Culp's Hill is just a half mile east and a little bit south of Cemetery Hill. And it's a different looking hill. It's a wooded, rocky, steeper hill. Not as good for artillery, but still any hill is advantageous. He didn't send anyone there. Now, when he arrived on the first day, 2nd Corps Union Commander Winfield Scott Hancock not only restores order to the retreating Union soldiers to first to Cemetery Hill, but he also spots the importance of Culp's Hill and sends Wadsworth's division of the 1st Corps over there as well. So that by the time the Confederates check that hill out, it's too late. There's Union forces there. Hmm. So the first day ends with the Union forces having lost another battle. And as more Union Corps arrive throughout the night and then the next morning and even into the afternoon, it won't be until about four o'clock or so that the the Sixth Corps is here of the Union Army. But by that time, the Union Army occupies not just Culp's and Cemetery Hill, which are the curving parts of the fish hook, Culp's Hill being where you'd put the worm, the barbed end, but it extends south from a ridge from Cemetery Hill called Cemetery Ridge to a little hill called Little Round Top. Mm -hmm. The whole Union line on July 2nd will be about a three mile long line from where you tie the fishing hook the fishing line to the hook, little round top, all the way to cemetery or to Culp's Hill. And before before we get into uh, July second, uh, for those of you out there who are new to the whole study of Gettysburg and everything like that, Bob said before, uh, referring to Yule, if I were in his shoe, um, he did not misspeak. That is a um, a joke. It's a it's a guy joke, right? And well, guy jokes are like dad jokes, but much nerdier. <laughs> I'm a guy and a dad. Pity my children. Yeah. But uh, Yule Yule had a wooden leg. He was he only had one real leg, so that's uh, that's the joke there. But uh, and it always gets me every time he throws it in. <laughs> All right, so July second. Now we get to July second, and uh, what is Lee's plan for July second, and what happens? Well, there's discussion of of attacking, like we did yesterday, the Southerners, kind of from the left, uh, Jackson's men. That would be the guys coming from the north and from the northeast to continue. And now the assault would be against Cemetery and Culp's Hill. Under Yule, though, not to... Uh, Yeah. Yeah, Jackson's former Jackson's former men. I'm glad you said that. Right. Right. I I just don't want to confuse people. Jackson Jackson is dead by this point. (laughs) Yes. And buried in two places. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, um, so that's that's so, uh, under some discussion. But uh, there's a problem for Lee. This Richard Ewell is is not as aggressive as Stonewall Jackson, and uh, so Lee is going to instead turn to James Longstreet, his only. Uh, veteran corps commander. Okay. His old war horse, as Lee would call him. So Longstreet's going to launch the main attack, but that's going to come from the southwest. And it's going to come from the Confederate right. So if you're a boxer, think of Robert E. Lee um, going to hit with a right. What do you call right it? Hook? Right hook. <laughs> yeah, right hook. <laughs> but you don't. You want to confuse the Yankees and not let them know exactly where the attack is coming from. And you don't want the Northerners to shift men to stop the main attack. So right. you make a fake with your left. <laughs> right, okay. Okay, and so Richard Ewell's second core, his role in this is to make a demonstration against Culp's and Cemetery Hill 
which you know Lee had considered as his main his main attack, but is not going to do it to keep those men on Cemetery and Culp's Hill, those Union men in place. The main attack's coming from Longstreet. It's going to take Longstreet a long time to get his men into position to attack. Not until about four o'clock in the afternoon of the second day does the Army of Northern Virginia begin to advance again against the Union position. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the main attack. They were supposed to get around the left end of the Union line or the south end of the Union line, wherever that may be. They thought they knew where it was when they started out, but it it wasn't there. Okay. And to get into their rear, the north has only two roads left behind their lines of the 10 roads coming into Gettysburg. They lost eight of them on the first day. Mm -hmm. And if you can cut off the road that heads due north into Gettysburg or out of Gettysburg, it's called the Tawny Town Road then you're going to cut off one of the few avenues of escape for the Army of the Potomac and make supply very difficult for them. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're hopefully going to get into the Union rear, cut off that road, and just in Civil War parlance, it would be called rolling up the flank. You're, 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 you're making the Union line dissolve from the end. Like a domino effect. Yeah, like a domino effect. And this is what happened to two months earlier at the Battle of Chancellorsville. The only what happened th- the day before. It happened the day before by accident of the way the roads came in, right. Uh, the only, not the only difference, but a major difference here is it's going to be the Union left that'll get rolled up, not as in yesterday in a Chancellorsville mm-hmm. to the right. And the attacker is not Stonewall Jackson or even Jackson's former command. It's James Longstreet, okay. who is a very good general. But he's more defensive minded and he is somewhat slow to get in a position to make this attack. There's some good reasons for him to be so slow and there's some bad reasons. And one of your later podcasts, I'm sure we'll be talking about all this. It's fascinating, mm-hmm. but it won't be until 23 and a half hours after the end of fighting on the first day that the second day's main attack is going to begin. And there we have um, the bloodiest part of the battle. You've got places that have earned their pages in American history as being some of the bloodiest spots anywhere in American history. Little Round Top, the Devil's Den, the Wheat Field, the Peach Orchard, the Emmitsburg Road. As in order of attack, they are coming under attack in the next three hours. Mm -hmm. What Longstreet calls the finest three hours of fighting ever done by any men in any battlefield. Think outside the bus and let Getty's Bike Tours show you the only way to truly experience Gettysburg. There's a reason why Getty's Bike Tours is the longest running bicycle tour company in Gettysburg, and that's because they put the customer's experience at the top of their list of priorities. Follow a licensed battlefield guide through some of the most legendary ground in American history. There's a tour route for everyone, from the newbie to the hardcore history buff. So go to Gettysbike.com or call 717-752-7752 and book your reservation today. Mention addressing Gettysburg and receive 10% off your tour. That's Gettysbike.com or 717-752-7752. Discount does not apply to rentals. By the end of that three hours, the sun will set at 730, just at the end of this three hours, and this would be chapter three. The fish hook is still intact, barely, Mm -hmm. but it's intact. But ground west of the fish hook that Union Third Corps Commander Daniel Sickles had advanced to not necessarily obeying orders, a V-shaped line in front of the fish hook. He was supposed to be the bottom part or the south part of the fish hook, including everything from Little Round Top about a mile north to where today the big white dome of Pennsylvania monument sets for your listeners who have been here before. Rather than occupy that position, Sickles, before the battle began, moved forward to occupy a V-shaped line, the center of which, the peach orchard, is three-fourths of a mile west of where he was supposed to be. Mm. The left or south end of that V-shaped line 
was only about 550 or so yards from where they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be at Little Round Top, but now they're at a pile of boulders called the Devil's Den. In between the left end of the V-shaped line, the Devil's Den, and the center part, the Peach Orchard, is Mr. Rose's Wheat Field. And then the V will bend back towards the Union Fish Hook along the Emmitsburg Road, as General Sickles put Humphrey's division of his corps along that road. Okay. So by the end of the day on July 2nd, the Southerners have captured the V-shaped line that Sickles had moved forward to without being ordered to. Mm-hmm. But the fish hook still holds, and it's the bloodiest part of the battle. Okay, and then so... Um that all occurs, and you mentioned before that Yule is to demonstrate over on the right, uh, around Culp's Hill. The Union right. The Union right, I'm right. sorry, yeah. Um, does Yule do that? What comes of that whole? Well, an artillery demonstration uh, is going to take place uh, within a half hour or so after Longstreet's artillery opened fire. So it seems like there was some coordination there. Mm-hmm. But uh, the Confederate artillery positions are not very good, not numerous at all, just one. And uh, that's not really going to be enough to hold the Union 12th Corps in place around Culp's Hill. That was the intent of this demonstration. And so the 12th Corps is being taken off of the barbed end of the fish hook and sent over to stop the main attack, Longstreet's attack from the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Now, not all those 12th Corps soldiers made it. Some did, some were helpful. But the point is, the demonstration or the fake against the Union left doesn't do its job in holding the 12th the Corps. Union right. In, the Union right, sorry. Yep. Thank you. Doesn't do its job of holding the 12th Corps in position, which means that when, when Ewell, the Confederate Second Corps commander, finally does advance his infantry, the sun has already set, just barely, mm-hmm. but the sun has set and the darkness is setting in. But what is happening is there's an opportunity now because most of the 12th Corps is no longer up on Culp's Hill. One brigade, General George Sears Green's brigade, roughly 1,300 New Yorkers, was still up there, as well as the Iron Brigade and parts of Wadsworth's division of the 1st Corps. But most of the men defending Culp's Hill are no longer there. And Ewell's orders from Lee had been to demonstrate against those hills, but to turn it into an an attack if an opportunity presented itself, which, of course, it did. Mm -hmm. And so for a few hours on the night of July 2nd at Culp's Hill, three Confederate brigades are trying to seize that hill. At the outset, they outnumbered the Union forces by quite a bit. But using the advantage of interior lines, the inside of the fish hook, other Union Corps are going to be able to send help to Culp's Hill, to General Slocum's area, including even one regiment from Hancock on the other side of the straight part of the Union Fishhook on Cemetery Ridge. But primarily, regiments are coming from closer Cemetery Hill as Howard is sending men over there. So in the darkness, up a rugged hill, and mostly aided by a breastwork, a wall that the Union soldiers had built on Culp's Hill. They had all day there before the attack, so they built a significant fortification or breastwork. The Confederates will will capture a large part of Culp's Hill, but not all of it. And a couple hours after it began, they just stop attacking. It's dark. It's kind of futile. There's now enough Union forces, and they just stop attacking. Hmm. Now, while that attack was going on, Ewell, the Confederate Second Corps commander, also made a demonstration turned into an actual attack against the east side of Cemetery Hill. The one at Culp's Hill began a little bit earlier, but shortly after it began, two Confederate brigades are attacking the east side of Cemetery Hill. They will be fighting hand-to-hand for possession of some of the Union artillery at the top of the hill, having broken through the the defensive position near the base of the hill. But Again, using the advantage of interior lines, General Hancock, the second corps commander on the other side of the cemetery, is now sending a brigade over to help out Howard. And Howard's sending his own men from Mm. one part of the hill to the other Mm. part, too. This is a mess. It's a mess. Yeah. Yeah. 
But again, the North has these advantages of interior lines and these Union forces aided by darkness, aided by a little bit of confusion. Um, uh, uh, Hancock's brigade will not be fired upon immediately because they were mistaken for Confederate forces because General Rhodes's division was supposed to be advancing by this time from the West and it's dark and okay, here come these guys. Well, guess what? They're Union, not Confederate. Hmm. So but the Confederates didn't fire the them is what you're saying. Right. right. And the Union forces, this is uh, Carroll's brigade of Hancock's Second Corps, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia boys, will restore order to Cemetery Hill and the two Confederate brigades, North Carolinians and Louisianans, will be driven back to the original starting points. So it sounds like day two was a real doozy. Mm -hmm. So Lee must want to go back to Virginia after all this stuff, right? Uh, No. Oh, he came so close to winning on the second day. And Uh I don't want to steal thunder from later podcasts. No, no, no. No, no. Most of your readers will probably at least be aware of how close they got to capturing Little Round Top. Okay. Both in terms of time. Had they been a little bit earlier, perhaps they might have been able to seize Little Round Top Um, Mm -hmm. in terms of brave actions taken by Union officers, even perhaps risking their own military careers, not following the chain of command slavishly when they discover that there's forces needed at Little Round Top. I'm thinking of Colonel Strong, Vincent's Brigade first, and Colonel Patrick O'Rourke's regiment of Weed's Brigade a little bit later, and and others. There, there's great, great stories that you're all going to love as you hear about this. And, and um they came close to winning on the second day. Okay. They came very so close. So then that must have made him want to stay and push the advantages that he's Correct. gained and, and then win on the third, which I'm sure he did, Correct. right? Having almost won at Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill and Little Round Top at those flanks, it, it, how often are you ever again going to have the ability to get this far north and to right. win a victory on northern soil? We won yesterday. It wasn't big enough, but we won yesterday and we almost won today. We didn't exactly lose. We captured that whole V-shaped line. Right, of General right. Sickles. Yeah. And the bloodshed was incredible on the second day. The second day was the bloodiest day of the Battle of Gettysburg, the second bloodiest day in American history. And so we have a fresh division that we haven't used yet. George E. Pickett's division, the last of Longstreet's divisions. It wasn't used at all on July 2nd. And so the the temptation was there to stay. I don't even think it was a temptation. I don't think there's anything in Robert E. Lee's nature that will make him want to leave, not Mm -hmm. after the two days we've had here. Right. And so we will fight again tomorrow on July 3rd. Okay. So what is the plan then for July 3rd? Well, again, at first, Lee is contemplating a resumption of the attacks of July 2nd, the flanks. And while he's discussing this with Longstreet, who is resisting because, oh, my God, what they did yesterday and the kind of opposition they encountered and the number of casualties they took Mm -hmm. at the Devil's Den, the Wheat Field, the Beach Orchard, Little Roundup. Um, Longstreet is not (laughs) in favor of this at all, but they, they they can hear and become aware of the fight at Culp's Hill has erupted again early in the morning, perhaps as early as four o'clock. Now, if you think, well, how, what the, how can I even see? Remember, there's no daylight savings time. So as soon as it begins to get a little light, the fight erupts at Culp's Hill. Now, who again. starts the fight on, on the second? Is it the Union uh, at Culp's Hill? Is it the Union or the Confederates? I'm not sure that I know. I, in my mind, I see, and I'm sure there's people who do know, and please Instagram, Matt, he loves that. And he'll have you as a guest. Yeah. Um, Charlie Fennell will be a later guest. So oh, that would yeah. be a great question yeah. to ask of Charlie. I've already got a couple of episodes from last summer in the can with Charlie that I'm going to put out. Awesome. So, yeah. yeah. So it, to answer, in my mind, this is speculation. I see some sleepy eyed union soldier behind a breastwork who heard a snap of a twig <laughs> And fires at it, mm-hmm. and then everyone begins shooting again. Although the Confederates had intended and do intend to attack. But so the Union brings it on beforehand. Uh, I'm not sure. That's, okay. that's my imagination. Maybe it was a, 
it was an actual snap of a branch. But the point is, for seven hours then, right. there will be this fight at Culp's Hill. This is the longest sustained single action of the Battle of Gettysburg, although often ignored in the discussion of Gettysburg, the, the morning fight of July 3rd. But by 11 o'clock that morning or so, four, uh, seven hours later, the Confederate forces have been driven off of Culp's Hill and they're no longer resuming any attacks. Mm -hmm. It was mostly Confederate attacks against the Union. One Union officer summed it up best. The amazing thing is that they persisted for seven hours and what must have seemed impossible after the first half hour. And so Culp's Hill by 11 or so falls quiet. The Union right the barbed end of the fish hook is safe. The Union left, Little Round Top, is safe. There's a lot of men in that area from yesterday's attack. Lee has a fresh division, pickets. Pickets, right. The Union must have reinforced their flanks from their center. Typical Napoleonic doctrine would dictate after attacking the flanks, you next attack the center knowing that they've Weakened the center to... Exactly. Yeah. And he makes the decision to attack the Union Center okay. using Pickett's division. By this time, J. Johnston Pettigrew is in command of Harry Heath's division. You're going to use both of those divisions in their entirety, although Pettigrew's division took incredible casualties on July 1st. Right. It's nowhere near the strength it was two days ago. And he will augment it with two brigades of Isaac Trimble's division behind Pettigrew's and to Pickett's right, two brigades from Hill's Corps, Anderson's division, Floridians and Wilcox's Alabama brigade. He, 50 regiments. He believes it'll be about 15,000 men in, in round numbers. It wasn't. It was probably 12,500 or something near there. And he is going to decide to strike the center of the Union line. James Longstreet tries to talk him out of it. Something like, uh, sir, I've been in the army my entire life. I know as well as any man what a soldier can do. And I'm telling you, sir, there's no 15,000 men that have ever been arrayed for battle that could possibly capture that height. Lee says, nevertheless, the enemy's there and I'm going to strike him. <laughs> and he did. Yeah. Now he starts off with a cannonade, a bombardment. Mm -hmm. um, now, do you buy into, do you hear these claims about, oh, they could hear it in Philadelphia and, and everything like that? Do I, you, uh, I don't know about the distance claims. Mm -hmm. I, I have a hard time believing many of those Philadelphia, what's that, 110 miles? I'm not sure I buy that. Washington, like that. 69 miles. I seldom buy things from Washington. <laughs> um, 90 miles west a journalist sitting on a porch claims to have heard the sound of the cannons. There's Steeler fans out there. So you can't, <laughs> can't buy that. I'm a Cleveland Browns fan. Sorry. Um, I do put some credence on the deaf man. There's a story about a deaf man who signs to his friends. This is in a town of Gettysburg. Right. Now, very close. Who signs to his friends. That one was close during the fight. Right. And but you could, that's different because you're feeling that. Right. Yeah. And I didn't used to tell that story on a tour either until I started to pay attention to whether or not I could feel vibrations at fireworks and so forth. Yeah. So I do tend to put some, some faith on that. Sure. Um, to describe the effectiveness of the artillery barrage, um, General Hunt, the Union artillery commander, will say something to the effect of, as a fireworks display, it was magnificent. As an artillery display, it was a humbug. Mm. Do you think that's kind of a little bluster there? Like he's trying to downplay the effectiveness of it? Because didn't, uh, wasn't it something like uh, there were only a, a few guns from... Uh, the artillery brigade that was covering the area of the, the cops of trees that were still functioning after the bombardment. Yeah, there were uh, Cushing's battery and uh, Brown's battery in particular, just south and just north of the famous cops of trees, which is what Lee's men were heading towards. They had yeah. to have something on the horizon a mile away that they could point towards and say head there. And it was this group of seven or eight or so trees, the cops. So, yeah, it wasn't. And calling it a humbug, 
it doesn't mean it wasn't um, <laughs> deadly for some. <laughs> Alonzo right. Cushing will receive the Medal of Honor in 2014 from Barack Obama. Uh, he was hit three times during this artillery barrage, um, all at the same time as one of his limbers exploded, and he'll end up dead. Uh, Brown's battery had to be removed. That's the one just south of the trees. Cushing only had, I think, one gun that he and his men could operate by the end. But there are other artillery batteries are going to come in <laughs> to replace. Sure. Those. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, but it's not, in, in other words, it's, it's not that it, it, it didn't have any effect. No, it's just that it wasn't enough. anything that they couldn't overcome. Correct. Yeah. Not enough effect. Just of, uh, Oh, well, okay. So then, so the bombardments over the, the, the pickets, men and Pettigrew's men and Trimble's men go across the field. Obviously they don't make it. Uh, well, they make it, but it doesn't work. It doesn't accomplish its goal. Um, what does Lee decide to do afterwards? After Pickett's charge? After Pickett's charge. Is he going to try something else or what is, what is he? No, he's, he realizes the, the magnitude of the losses he's taken. Um, not quantitative. He won't get those numbers for quite a while. In mm. fact, even today, I don't think anyone has that answer. Right. But six to 7,000 is the estimate. 40 to 60% of the attacking force. He will admit right away that it was all his fault. He will have to assume a defensive posture. He's an enemy country. And I've never read this or anything, but if it's me, I'm, I've never read this about Lee, but if right, it's right. me, I'm thinking I might be lucky to get out of here <laughs> right. with my army intact. <laughs> yeah. And so he's got to be thinking about... Um, what to do, first of all, if the Union follows this up with an aggressive move of their own. Right. And so he's getting his units into his defensive posture. He's beginning to tighten up his line instead of making it a, a seven mile line that arcs on the outside of the Union by July 3rd, three and a half mile line. He pulls out from the town. He's making his line pretty much a straight north south line line more than it was curving around. He's up on Seminary Oak Ridge now. Uh, breastworks are being constructed in case the, the Union attacks. Mm -hmm. He's getting ready to repulse an attack, which could happen, which okay. is what any responsible army commander has to do. Sure. This is taking time. All day, 4th of July, the Union forces are not attacking. <laughs> Uh, understand that the two most aggressive generals, well, this is my opinion, corps commanders anyway, in the Union Army are both casualties. John Reynolds dead on the first day and Winfield Hancock at the climax of Pickett's Charge on the third day. Hancock right. will survive his wound, but yeah. he is, he's in bad shape. And Meade is, is a cautious man by nature. And he's brand new on the job. I mean, right, he's, he's right. on a job six days now. And now it's July 4th is, is a, um, a Saturday. It's, it's been a week now since he's been in command. And he yeah. just did something no other Union commander had done. Beat Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. And he's taken, well, the numbers there are easier to pin down, 23,000 casualties yeah. in the last three days. I've, I've gotten over this past summer, I've gotten a lot of conversations with people who are new to studying the whole battle. And, and when we get to this point, they always go, I just don't understand why he just didn't go after Lee. And you have to remind them of, you know, the union was in pretty bad shape too. Mm -hmm. the union army, the Potomac, they, they weren't, it's not like they took four casualties and everybody was having a picnic, <laughs> right. you know? So uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a it's a tough thing to put your head around if you haven't been in that situation. So before we move on to July fourth uh, and the retreat and all that other stuff, to go back to an earlier point about who started the fighting over at Culps Hill, mm -hmm. I referred to the Gettysburg Rail Diary here that I've uh, started <laughs> writing in two thousand four. Uh, this is let's see. It says Alpheus Williams, acting Twelfth Corps commander, had enough light to see shadowy figures on the Confederate line and ordered Lieutenant Muhlenberg, the Twelfth Corps artillery commander, to open fire at Culp's Hill. Um, after fifteen minutes or so, Union troops were supposed to spring into action, but it was Johnson's rebels who acted first. 
Okay. So there. So it sounds like artillery. So artillery opened yeah. it up and then the but infantry. because they saw shadowy figures. Yeah. 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 And this would be from Trudeau? That was from Trudeau, Trudeau. yeah. Okay. No, Andre Trudeau. Okay. So July 4th, Independence Day. Lee, uh, is he still here in Gettysburg or is he gone? What, what's, what's going on on July 4th? Uh, both armies are still here. Okay. Lee is still here. Um, during the daylight hours, the Confederates are in a defensive posture, ready to resist an attack if it comes. Um, of course, it didn't come. And any, uh, any kind of skirmishing, pot shots going on, mm, anything? At this point, I would yeah, imagine. Yeah, there's skirmishing and stuff. I can't. Right, but nothing, nothing head, huge. Just, right. Uh, right. And they're basically, again, they're pulling out of the town. And uh, in the town, Union skirmishers are entering now and, and occupying positions where Confederates had been, finding some of their own people that had been hiding mm, <laughs> for mm. the last couple of days right. behind Confederate lines. But um, there's nothing major in terms of attacks. Okay. It's more the Confederates beginning to withdraw from the town and tightening up their line. And with nightfall will come a little bit of security. Now it was a, a rainy day and there was a big thunderstorm. Uh -huh. And under the cover of the darkness and the storm, Lee will begin withdrawing on the night of the 4th of July. Okay. And uh, his wagons are going out. The Chambersburg Pike is able-bodied men will go later because um, they got to protect the rear. And they're going to be going out various roads, but a lot of them out the uh, Hagerstown Road, Route 116 today to the west-southwest. And um, yeah, they begin their withdrawal. By the 14th of July, they will be safely across the Potomac River. Mm -hmm. But not without, they, there, there's a moment there where they're, it's kind of scary because the Potomac is swollen from all the rain and they can't cross it. So right. they have and, to. And more than a moment. It, it's a, a, well, yeah. more than a day, actually. Right. And the, conf, the Union Army is, is, is arriving there. And uh, before they accumulate enough forces, remember, George Meade is a cautious commander by nature. Mm -hmm. um, Lee was able to slip his army across the river on the 14th of July. Before the Union could actually Before do it. Before they actually did much. Yeah, there that, was some that Williamsport, right? Yeah, yeah. right. There was, and but, that's uh, Williamsport. They do uh, get across. There, there was... Um, Further down the river, there was some Abraham skirmishing, Lincoln, obviously. Is, and there were people who were going to die. Almost yeah, hourly, right, I think, visiting the home. telegram room of the War Department, waiting for news from George Meade about the fate of Lee and his army, knowing that the fate of the nation might hang in the balance. Right. Expecting a celebratory telegram announcing that they have captured Lee and the army. <laughs> Lincoln will be disappointed by the telegram he reads announcing that we have driven the enemy from our soil. Uh. Lincoln will say something to the effect of, when will I find a commander who understands that Virginia is our soil, right. will be angry with Meade, write a letter to fire him, yeah. never send the letter, and doesn't fire Meade. He will stay in command the rest of the war. He just kind of vented his anger, and then later he'll say something to the effect of, how can I fire a man who's done so much for his country just because he didn't do a little bit more? Uh -huh. And uh, the war's going to go on. Another 21 months, it turns out, though Lincoln and Meade and Lee wouldn't have known it at that point. Right. There'll be just as much blood shed in the 21 months after Gettysburg as in the 27 months that preceded Gettysburg. But no single battle will shed as much blood as the estimates range between 44,000 and 51,000 casualties that fell in the three days at Gettysburg. What do you recommend a first time visitor to Gettysburg do when they come here? Well, I'm going to say this, visit the cemetery because it's very moving and it helps you to understand why what happened here was so important. And also contemplate the role that Lincoln played here, even though he wasn't at this battle and the timelessness of his words in dedicating that cemetery as he challenges every generation of Americans to consider the great task remaining before us, that, that this kind of government based on an idea that all men are created equal, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, 
should have a new birth of freedom. And each generation is challenged to work that out for themselves, how to keep that kind of government alive. Mm -hmm. I agree. Hire a guide. And um, also, if you if you want, uh, I know a handful of guides and every single one of these guides makes it about you and your experience here and not about them and what they know. And so uh, you can send an email to Matt at addressing Gettysburg.com and I'll put you in touch with any one of them. Also, um, you can send an email to that email address if you have any questions about anything that we talked about today or if there's something that you would like to hear over on the Patreon content, which would be a lot more, uh, more of a micro history over there where we're talking about very specific topics within the overall Gettysburg umbrella. And um, yeah, uh, that's about it. So again, it's Matt at addressing Gettysburg.com. Bob, thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Do you have anything you want to add? Yeah. Okay. Bicycling is a great way to feel the battlefield. Oh, it is. uh, You can, you can get a guide to go on a bicycle tour with you. Um, there's all sorts of different kinds of, of tours, uh, Segway, horseback, um, right. Most people do it by automobile. Um, yeah. Yeah. And go to the national park visitor center too. And if you do do it by automobile, mm-hmm. get out of the car, mm-hmm. drive to a spot, get out and explore with a guide. You got to do it with a guide. And I tell this to people all the time. You, you, I'm such a, a huge fan of the guides. And I think y- you can't go wrong going with with any guide. I mean, they, these guys know their stuff. It's not easy to get these licenses that they have. Um, and uh, so you, you can be sure that if they've got a license, if they've got that patch on their arm, uh, they know what they're talking about. And you, you, if you, if you think you can come here once and take a tour with a guide and you've seen it all. And now every time you come back afterwards, you just go out on your own. You are gravely mistaken. I say, get a guide every time you come here and just get a little bit more focused as you, uh, as you, with each time that you come, like, you know, find out what you're interested in, have the guides take you to those specific things or that specific day or whatever it may be. Um, and then go out on your own after you've gone with a guide, go out on your own and explore some more. But anyway, um, Yes, Bicycles, one of our sponsors, Getty's Bike Tours, there's probably a commercial that I popped right in the middle of this very recording that we're listening to now. So <laughs> that's what happens on the free feed. You can't, get, uh, you can't get away without being commercialized. So anyway, that's it. Again, Matt at addressinggettysburg.com. If you have any questions, if you want uh, me to put you in touch with any guides um, that I recommend, or um, what was the other thing I said? Oh, yeah, any topics that you would like to hear us talk about over on Patreon when we get that all set up, and that will come out later on, in an announcement on another upload. Anyway, thanks again, Bob. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, everybody.